Mark? Neil, how are you? Hey, pretty good. How are you doing? I'm good. How was your day? Very good. How about you? Oh, it was good also. Busy, but very good. Oh, okay. That's good to hear. Well, always trying to be as punctual as possible. So. Oh, that was perfect. I was just uh, <laughs> sitting down, and the kids and wife were out shopping so for Christmas, so... Okay. Good, perfect time. Good, good. Okay. Um, I'm just going to do the... Uh, phone interview here. Um, I'm at my office and uh, I've got everything set up to record. Great. So uh, okay. make sure I don't miss any information or or anything because um, I'm going to be posting all this on my website uh, to let all the fans know about it. Great. Um, are you familiar with my website at all? Yeah, we, I, my kids went and looked it up uh, last night after you um, left your message and I took a look. It's quite impressive. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've, I've had it for coming up on ten years now. So, and it's um, it's really grown quite a bit from when I first started it back in '98. But uh, yeah, I'm really proud of it and happy of the number of visitors and information I can pass along to everyone that does stop by. So right. It's done really well. Good. Okay. Um, first question I wanted to ask you is just um, a little bit of inform uh, information about yourself. Uh, background information like um, where you were born and where you've lived and uh, pretty much um, everything leading up to the starring role in Superman 4. Okay. <laughs> where should I begin? <laughs> I guess just, just start by, well, I was born in Leeds, Yorkshire, Northern England. My okay. parents met in Tripoli, Libya. My father was an Air Force officer. My mother worked for the Air Force. She was British. And after, I guess, my conception, I was, uh, my mother went back to live with her her mother, her parents in Leeds, and that's where I was born. Stayed there for about a year, then moved back to the, to Texas with the family. Uh, stayed there until I about four or five years old and moved to Brazil, Recife, Brazil. It's on the coast. Okay. Uh, my dad was a chemical engineer with Firestone, and he moved around the world showing people how to start up factories, um, uh, chemical factories. He would pretty much almost an instructor and manager. And after two and a half years, I guess kindergarten through the end of second grade, moved back to Texas, went half a year of third grade in Orange, Texas, then moved to Harbel, Liberia, West Africa. Um, my dad, again, for work, it was a big rubber plantation. We uh, were there for four years. I was there second half of third grade through the end of seventh and came back to Texas again, eighth grade, uh, through high school, moved around a couple of times, and then went off to Texas A&M and was studying engineering there and was part of their Corps of Cadets. And after about a year and a half, actually, got very ill, mononucleosis, I think a little bit too much study, a little bit too much um, core activity, I suppose, and just got a little rundown. Right. And right. moved back home to recover from that and had time to reflect on things. and. Worked a few different jobs, worked for the airlines, worked for Delta, uh, worked for oil companies, and things kept ending, either by bankruptcies, bankruptcies or things like that, and decided, I met this young lady named Shelly Gruel, who was a competitive bodybuilder, and I was very much into training then, and she lived in Fresno, and it was I had visited California several times, and all of a sudden there was an opportunity thinking, well, I'll this is my new girlfriend, I'll move out that way. And it, 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 I was there from three or four months in Fresno until it finally didn't work out. Lovely girl. Probably I wasn't quite the, the right person for her at that time. Okay. Uh, and then moved to L.A. I suppose that was probably 83. And just spent time working, bartending, and started taking classes. Uh, bartending, waiting, taking classes like everybody does. You move into L.A., you, you feel like you want to pursue something in the business, and you uh, involve yourself in class. And um, started meeting people and was away in Denver at the time doing some work when my agent just they called and said, I've got this uh, possibility for Superman. Mm -hmm. Can you be here tomorrow? And it was right out of the blue because I had to make some quick changes. So I uh, flew out. And Sidney Fury's son had met me and suggested me for this role of nuclear man. I guess they were having a difficult time casting it. And the problem is that English really wanted somebody from Europe to do it. And they, right. I guess it's some kind of an agreement they have that so, a certain amount of characters of our actors are American. And then being filmed in the British Isles, you needed some from the, uh, from the European continent. And I guess they had a bit of a difficult time. 
finding somebody. But I, the first month I was in London, I, I don't think I had the role. I think they had to jump through hoops to make to prove that they had they had looked and they uh, and the, they're the person that they wanted. So I guess that's in a nutshell. I mean, if anything along the way that I've missed, that you can always, of course, go back to. But I, I could I could drag <laughs> I could I could write an essay, I suppose, <laughs> if you let me. <laughs> I know originally in the movie there was actually a second nuclear man also played by uh, Clive Mantle. Yes. Um, was that footage also filmed while you were there as well, or had that already been done? And no, that was that was all done while I was there. When I got to London, in September of '86, they hadn't started production yet. The sets were built, but most of the stuff was done during uh, his work was a probably during that first month where I was just uh, sitting and waiting. And, uh, of course, we all know what happened to his footage. And he, I, he was lovely. I mean, wonderful in the part. I'm, I never saw the movie uncut to see exactly what he did, but he mm -hmm. was certainly a talent. Right. He is a talent. I know he's still working. Right, yeah. I've, I've read some information about him that he still uh, does some stage work um, over in Europe. Uh, and I believe he's actually done some directing as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, good for him. Um, now, actually working on the film itself, uh, what was it like working with uh, Chris and, and Gene and the other cast members? Oh, wonderful, wonderful experience. One of those times you're actually doing something, and you each day show up on the set thinking, this, this is special. This is not many people get to do this. Mm -hmm. And I felt very privileged to be in the company of such fine actors and really got along well with them all. I uh, didn't spend time with them outside, uh, off the set in Elstree Studios. Occasionally, I think with Gene and uh, Mariel, we went to dinner a couple of times in Sydney, but not with Chris. Uh, but over lunch, five, six days a week, mm -hmm. uh, just listening to them tell stories is worth every moment. I mean, you, you just sit there with Gene Hackman and, and just... Don't say a word. Right. Just listen. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's just unbelievable. I, uh, he's certainly one of my, probably my, my favorite person of the film, just because he'd been through so many things. I think he'd said he'd, but he was a Marine, he'd been a bricklayer and a bread truck driver, and he'd been through all this. And, you know, he, he'd worked his way up to the position he was in. And very, very professional. He would show up on the set before the crew mm -hmm. and would just, would just walk through the set working with his lines, preparing himself. I mean, very, very professional, as everybody was. I mean, uh, John Cryer, the same, just wonderful. Good fun to be around and, um, uh, you know, people that you look up to and you get a chance to actually spend some time with them was quite a privilege. Right, right. And yeah, for John, that was, uh, like, one of his very first acting roles, and now to see him on uh, Two and a Half Men, it's just... Um, Kind of cool to see, you know, how much he's he's gone from from then in 21 years to where he is now. And what's what's crazy about it, he doesn't look any different. Exactly. I yeah. look at it thinking, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I look in the mirror and I go, I, I I resemble who I used to look like, but I certainly look different. I mean, John looks incredible. <laughs> right. <laughs> and a fine show also. I think he actually had trained. He was well trained. He'd gone to school, I believe, in London at the Royal Performing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. He certainly had the chops, that's for sure, and it was obvious working with him. Now, the final film that was released, of course, due to budget constraints and with Canon Films, um, a lot was cut out and the budget reduced. Uh, is there any footage or additional storyline that, um, by, of course, working on the picture, uh, as you did, that we just never saw that, if it had been actually left the way that it was originally filmed, uh, that in your opinion would have made for a much uh, more critically acclaimed movie than it was? Well, I, I think um, Clyde's part was, was integral. I mean, we, the, the way it had to be recut, and you couldn't quite understand why Nuclear Man was interested in Mariel's character, because you didn't, that part of the film was cut. Mm -hmm. And when you read the script, I mean, it, it had a good backstory, and it had a meaningful backstory, and it did, the original, the film, when it did come out, but all about nuclear disarmament, and I think that had it all come together with the money that was originally budgeted, I, and the 
special effects had come through, um, it, it would have been a pretty impressive film. I, a lot happened that I didn't know while I was there. I mean, I didn't know of the budget constraints and what was going on with Canon at the time. But you, but certainly Sydney seemed troubled. So, mm -hmm. uh, and looking back on it now, after knowing um, more of the story, I completely understand. I mean, I didn't see him the last week. He he didn't come to London for the premiere, and and it wasn't until I heard more of why that I and then. And then finally saw the, the final picture and just went, well, it's not what he envisioned, I'm sure. Right. Uh, now, after the uh, the movie was released, and um, of course, unfortunately, you know, it was kind of panned by the critics and a lot of the fans alike, um, the roles that you had after that, the only ones I've actually read about was that you appeared in uh, an episode of the TV series Wise Guy and also a Russian TV series called Alaska Kid, I yep. believe was the name of it. Um, can you give any uh, information into to those particular TV series? Like, um, what was the work that you did on those? Well, the wise guy uh, thing was just quick um, with Ken Wall up in Vancouver, and didn't have much on that to do. I mean, I've got a, a cut of it, but the series um, was a big co-production between Germany, Poland, Russia. Um, with a Oscar-winning British director named James Hill. He won an Academy Award for a short film that he had done. And the actors were American. Donovan Scott, who I now see on this commercial, plays every night with progressive insurance, and he plays the Santa Claus with a St. Bernard dressed up like a reindeer behind him. It's just wonderful to see him okay. <laughs> because he's so good. But that we were away for 18 months on that. I met my wife while we were in Poland. We started in Poland for six months. And we went to Czechoslovakia and then went off to Russia for 13 months. But um, uh, for them, a big production, they actually constructed an entire town based on an Alaskan town around the turn of the century. Because the, the story was based upon one of Jack London's books called Smoke Baloo. Right. Right. Book, I think it was almost a, on one of his short stories. And I played the lead character, Kid, who is a reporter who goes up to the Klondike to seek his fortune and to write about what's going on around the turn of the century. So um, wonderful filming in those countries because they the, the incredible technicians in, with Moss Film and in Poland. Um, challenging to get work done because you at, things are asked for and it doesn't show up, so you improvise. So a lot of improvisation. And a great second unit director. Uh, his, his name slips my mind right now, but he did about did second unit on about three or four of the Bond movies. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, I can't think of his name right now. But that was a wonderful experience. That was, I really got the chance to, to spend some time and actually use my own voice <laughs> <laughs> on camera. So that was that was nice. Yeah, that was, that was one thing I, I meant to ask you also, is if you were aware when you were doing Superman 4 that uh, Gene was actually going to be doing the lines for your character. Well, let me tell you how that worked out, because I don't think anybody really understands that whole process and why it turned out like it did. Okay. Because <laughs> it's, it's almost... Because it, it will explain everything about the look on my face as I'm saying the lines. Well, before we ever did any of those scenes, Gene recorded them on tape. So when we shot the scenes with me, when I needed to speak, I was lip-syncing to him. So off camera, they would do a three, two, one, and then drop the finger kind of thing, and that look on my face is I'm trying to tie my lips to Gene's voice. So instead of what's normally done, where actually I, if you, cho you chose to replace my voice, you would have me do the, the lines, and then, of course, take it into the studio and have Gene uh, dub them. But right, of course. It right. Was, I, and to this day, I mean, the director is the, is the governor. I mean, that was his choice, and I didn't, I didn't question it. I'm not... Uh, really sure why he made the choice. Maybe he didn't think my voice was appropriate. I don't know. But um, that's why. I mean, I look at it too, and I can see the look in my eyes that I'm not even. I don't even see anybody. All I can think is three, two, one, uh, kill or destroy Superman now. You know whatever right. it was. <laughs> 
So instead of looking like I was thinking for a moment and actually said something, which would have been <laughs> a lot more interesting to watch, that was the process. Okay. And that's why it looks the way it does. <laughs> that whole wooden look. <laughs> because every single line. And some of those things we, we retook time and time again. Oh, you missed the first syllable by a half a second. Let's do it again kind of thing. Right. <laughs> I, I, I had always kind of thought it may have been like, what they did for uh, David Prowse in Star Wars were, uh, you know, uh, a heavy British accent and then brought in James Earl Jones, and he had no idea that's what was going to be done. And I had always, you know, read that you were that you were born over in Europe. So I, I had always thought, of course, talking to you now, I realized completely wrong, but I'd always thought it was because you had a British accent, and <laughs> that's why they did it. So... <laughs> That is always, it's funny, as I, as I watch, all the years I'll go to IMDB and I'll be looking up some of the questions that I always have to laugh is, why the Gene voice and why the look on his face when he's saying it? And I, you know, and I was just thinking, someday I'm going to explain exactly how it was done. Right. <laughs> and the interesting choice that was made to do it at that time. So. Well, yeah. Anyway, good, got that off my chest. <laughs> Oh, well, definitely. I just, a lot of fans will now know the answer to that question, so <laughs> the mystery will be solved. <laughs> good, good, good. Now, I've also, um, as I mentioned to you when we, when we spoke earlier this morning to set up uh, this interview, um, I had seen a picture of you on a forum from uh, of you actually wearing the Nuclear Man costume, and you were meeting uh, Princess Di yes. in the photograph. Um, my question uh, pretty much is, is uh, why, why the decision to wear the costume to meet Princess Di? You know what? <laughs> if, I could, if I could probably take back one decision, that would be one of them. <laughs> Even though at the time, the reasoning was, well, that, the producers asked me. Okay. They said, will you please wear, because I think they wanted Chris to be there. And they wanted Chris to be in his outfit and to actually swoop down on Leicester Square and do all that stuff. Well, he wasn't going to have any part of that. Right. And uh, they asked me to wear it. And they you know, Mark, it'll be great for photo ops, but... When you're standing in line getting to meet the future king and queen of England, especially being that I'm British-born, right? It's a, and then to be standing in this skin-tight outfit, and, <laughs> oh yeah, I, I could, I could certainly take that back. Especially if my wife will, will pulls out these dog-eared magazine newspaper pictures and show her friends occasionally. And right. why is Mark standing there with spandex on? Poor Diana <laughs> to walk up to me and just go. Oh. <laughs> So that, that, that choice, again, was that I was asked, right. and, uh, I, and again, everything that I have ever done, or when I got to promoting films, it was always, what is in the best interest of the film, not mm -hmm. what's in the best interest of me. Right. So that's what it was for. And again, it, 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 it was great for uh, the, the photographers, as I'm sure. Me, it was, me, it was uh, <laughs> I, I, I could do without that now. <laughs> The uh, 21 years since Superman 4 came out, um, I guess uh, a good question would be is uh, over that course of time, um, up from what I've read and everything uh, of uh, movie credits and everything, uh, there wasn't any acting really that you did in that time span. Um, what have your jobs been since, uh, I guess, leaving the acting field? Well, I came back and I, 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 I met my, my wife while I was in Poland, and I had some money from the series that I'd done. Oh, I actually was going to say going back to Superman, it was like a three-year period inside there. And went back to bartending, auditioning, all the things. Yeah, I did some national commercials, um, studied, got into improvisation, and then took off in 1991. Then was focused then on getting my wife over to this country who didn't speak any English and is... Um, quite a challenge when you bring in somebody from a former communist country who you right. don't really understand how much you know until you try and teach somebody mm -hmm. how the system works. So I brought over here, we have two daughters, I have an 11 and a 16 year old, and just pretty much spent that time, went back into the bar business again, the thing that was, things that I'd always gone back to, went to work, uh, stayed with that for like nine years or so, which in looking back really worked out well in many ways. It might seem strange, but I lived a block off the beach in Santa Monica between Wilshire and Montana. 
I worked nights, my wife worked days, I took care of the kids during the day, my wife took care of them. At night, while I was out, I spent more time with my girls than most fathers ever get to have, which was a wonderful experience. And up until, I guess, four years ago, I was doing that, my wife thought, well, I want to change the scenery. And we didn't think L.A. was the greatest place to bring up the girls, even though Santa Monica is not L.A. Uh, and we moved to Steamboat Springs, Colorado. So we lived there. My, my sister is a CPA up there, and her husband, they have a company, a couple of companies. And moved to there three years ago. See, I've been back in Texas now just over a year, so four years ago. Okay. And in that time, I drove track hose, dozers, uh, uh, skid steers, took care of thoroughbred horses. I mean, when you live in this town like Steamboat, you're doing three jobs a year. Mm -hmm. Just more of like a search, trying things, trying this. We, what do you want to do kind of thing, trying to find my place there. And then um, opportunity came back to move back to Texas. And after about three winters, I think my three girls had had absolutely enough of 30 degrees below zero right. winters. <laughs> so we moved back to Houston, which is actually the Woodlands. I know when you see my address, it says spring, but I live in a wonderful place called the Woodlands. It's about 35 miles north of, of Houston. And Got my, I actually moved back into the house that I left. My mother went up to Steamboat, and I moved into this house. And again, I kind of went for a walk one day and said, oh, now what are you going to do now? This has been, <laughs> you've tried most everything. And I went back to knowledge of uh, being around the restaurant business, and I thought, well, I want to sell wines. So I spoke to a distributor in Houston, and they have a fine wine division. It's called Domains and Estates, a company called Glazers. And I rep the probably some of the greatest wines in the world are on the north side of Houston. And I've been doing that for about a, a year now, and it still boggles my mind at how much I don't know <laughs> about wine. But that's pretty much where I stand now. I was out all day today. Um, my wife is an esthetician, does facials. My kids both go. My, my oldest is in high school and the youngest is in sixth grade. And that is pretty much, in a nutshell, we really, it's been a very quiet year as far as doing anything outside of uh, work and take care of the girls and acclimate ourselves back to Texas again. Okay. It sounds like you've definitely done quite a bit since. <laughs> I think one time I sat down and I, I, I think I decided I've done about 35 different jobs right. since I was 15 mm -hmm. years old, from starting out as a dishwasher and then a bricklayer all the way through to selling wine. <laughs> so... Yeah, it's, it's been it's been an interesting ride, that's for sure. It, it always seems to evolve. Even now, I kind of go, oh, I'm learning this, but who knows what's going on down the road. I had a couple other questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, the newest movie that came out, uh, Superman Returns, did you happen to see it? I did. And what was your overall opinion of it? I mean, for it to be the first movie since 87. I, I enjoyed it. I mean, the special effects, especially uh, with the jet. Was that, I, I am got the right one with the beginning. Mm -hmm. Oh, incredible. I mean, that, that's what I really see things have evolved. I think a, a very good choice for Superman. I mean, it's hard to beat Chris. I mean, Chris Reeves, my gosh, that right. first Superman. Of course. Is, but I think the choice was good. The film was well done. I haven't even heard it. I, I suppose there's going to be a sequel to this last one. Well, it's being kicked around right now as to whether to do a sequel or to do a reboot. And uh, pretty much to uh, to wrap it up here, um, I was just going to ask you what the future holds. I mean, you had mentioned uh, getting into the wine industry now. Um, that's kind of what you're looking at for the future course right now or anything else on the horizon? I, I haven't had much time to think about much else. I mean, this, this first year has been such, so much toward learning what I'm doing. I was out, I was out in Napa and Sonoma, uh, September, visiting wineries, trying to get to the point that I feel uh, comfortable, or at least more comfortable with what I'm doing now, and then look toward broadening my horizons. I, I have little notes on the refrigerator going, you know, take a take an improvisation class and let's see where it goes. Go take a voiceover class and see if you want to do something like that. Maybe read books on tape or I, I need to find something creative. I just haven't quite put my my finger on 
on it. I mean, I, I pay my SAG dues every year and ask myself, why am I sending a check again? I'm not doing anything <laughs> with this. But somehow you just feel like you're living vicariously through people who are working and uh, you know, right. get the magazine each month. But uh, to that extent, I really haven't done anything toward that side of the business. But who knows in the future? Possibly might just try and dabble, even if it's just something for fun, maybe some stage or, or something like that. Right, okay. So that, that's it. I mean, everything right now seems to be about family. I, I, I'm focused so totally on them and their their happiness and uh, and getting them through through school and right. Right. physically and spiritually the best I can help them to be. I, I think that's been my biggest focus right now is, and with enjoying my wife and, and getting her career started here also. So it, it's been, that, that's been the year focus, and I think the, the new year will, will be looking outwards and thinking, well, uh, mm-hmm. hey, now what, what can we add to this? Right, right, okay. Right. Well, I absolutely appreciate, you know, allowing uh, me to conduct this interview with you. Um, Thank you. Anytime. I mean, it was a joy um, that you called. Thank you so much, because it was a pleasure just reliving some of the uh, what was a great period of time. I had a wonderful time with wonderful people. And any questions, anything else, please just call. Okay. All right. Well, I thank you again. And um, You're welcome. If there's, uh, of course, anything else I think of, I certainly know where to reach you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Have a good evening. You too.